and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And welcome back, my friends, to Event Comics Month 3, Crisis of the Secret House. This is a frustrating event. It is frustrating for many, many reasons. It is frustrating because there are assumptions about it that don't match up with what actually happens, some of which I am guilty of having myself. It is frustrating because there are moments that I actually would have rather enjoyed if they had been done well. It is frustrating because this is an event that was built up, and I did not really follow the build up like I have with other events, so some of the complaints that others have brought up are not things that I have read, so I can only judge it based on what I have, which is the event miniseries itself. It is frustrating frustrating because its writer, Nick Spencer, seemed to go out of his way to make it frustrating with statements that he made regarding plot points related to it. But I think if I'm most frustrated by anything at all, it's that this event is too damn long! House of M was padded to hell, but really what Bendis does is that he stretches things out. Stuff that should only take a page or two, he makes into two to four pages. Why fit three dialogue balloons into one panel when you can put it in two and make it last longer, am I right? But no, Secret Empire gets the job of having plenty of stuff happen, but as a result, the pacing makes it feel like we're taking forever to get anywhere. A first and last issue of an event will often be longer than the rest of the books, but the main bulk of the miniseries will have regular length issues. Not so for Secret Empire, which needed to have every issue last longer than normal. And it's very clear that Nick Spencer was stretching it out. The padding in House of M was at least good character stuff. It may not have advanced the story of House of M, but it at least gave the people it affected a chance to explore some interesting dynamics. Hell, I didn't mention it, but there's a moment where Peter is contemplating the idea that both him and Mary Jane are more successful apart than together, and he's mortified and gutted by that. Admittedly, simply existing seems to do that for Peter nowadays, but still... Not so much with this event. While character stuff that advances the plot exists, just as much padding exists simply because they needed to fill out the pages. Maybe if you're lucky, it'll set up potential stuff for stories after the event, but otherwise, just a waste of time in a book that's already too long. Hell, I think even Marvel realized that this event would drag, so they decided to mitigate the damage by having it come out twice monthly instead of once a month. Let's address the elephant in the room right away. This is the conclusion of the story about Captain in America being a Nazi. To take a figure created by Jewish writers and artists made specifically to combat the Nazis and all the evil they stood for is disrespectful to the character, to his creators, and to anyone who appreciates everything that Cap stood for. However, they didn't actually do that because he is not actually Captain America. TIME FOR BACKSTORY! We have mentioned many times on the show before an artifact known as the Cosmic Cube. The Cosmic Cube can do anything! And one of the anything that it can do is in fact evolve into a sentient life form, which has happened a few times. In this case, it evolved into a girl named Kobik. The Red Skull manipulated Kobik into believing that Hydra was actually a noble organization, and wouldn't it be nice if they could be in charge? And I guess instead of just doing that, she rewrites reality and replaces Steve Rogers with a version that has been a Hydra sleeper agent since childhood, with the various Nazi and Hydra villains he fought over the years actually being, like, best buds with him. This version of Steve Rogers believes that the Allies actually lost World War II to the Nazis, but that the Allies, in turn, used the Cosmic Cube to change reality so they won instead. Which doesn't really hold up to scrutiny when you then tilt your head and realize, wait, they did that but still allowed the Holocaust to happen and let their own soldiers and allied civilians die in massive numbers in said war when their version of history could have been that they created some super weapon that just made the Nazis explode or anything? Or maybe use the Cosmic Cube as said Nazi exploding super weapon? 
So no, Captain America was never a Nazi. When he said Hail Hydra in that highly memed, highly circulated first issue of his new book, that was not really him at all. The problem, however, is that they didn't tell anyone that! No one would have had a problem if it was just a case of mind control or something, but in interviews afterwards, Nick Spencer tried to play it off that it wasn't anything like that! Here's this choice bit from an interview with Comic Book Resources. How exactly did Kobik alter Steve? Did she use her powers to implant a false history in his mind? You just said a false history. And this is a big thing that I think we're gonna have to be saying a lot over the next few weeks. Kobik rewrote reality. So it's not really false then, is it? Yes! Yes it is! But it's important to understand that Steve is not brainwashed. He's not remembering things that didn't happen in that sense. This is Steve's reality. How that manifests and plays out remains to be seen, but the term false memories doesn't apply here. So this is not something that Steve can willpower his way through. This is not something that Steve can fight back against. The reality of the Steve Rogers we know and love has essentially been wiped out. That is not a person that ever existed. Now, to be fair... 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 To be fair, the language that Spencer used is couched in a way that it can still apply to this being an alternate Steve Rogers, not the real one, and that's probably to help protect from spoilers of how the story ultimately ends. But then that just comes across as being massively disingenuous and insulting. There's no attempt to assuage the very genuine concerns people had about a symbol of everything good and decent in the Marvel Universe, the guy who punched Hitler on his inaugural issue, that this was just an evil scheme. And not to worry, the one we know and love will be back. To make matters worse, neither Spencer nor Marvel seem to understand the implications of a lot of the stuff around the event. For starters, they were encouraging retailers to be part of the promotion of Secret Empire by buying Hydra paraphernalia to wear when selling it. Apparently not realizing, hey, maybe wearing the outfits promoting the Nazi-affiliated group sends a bad message, especially during a time of when it feels like nationalism and supremacy groups are on the rise. Even worse, just gonna get this out of the way since we're not technically covering it as part of this review, the Secret Empire Free Comic Book Day issue has a Hydra cap lifting Mjolnir, implying that the frickin' Nazi is worthy of the power of Thor. Now, it'd be revealed five months later that he was able to do so because the enchantment had changed. But that was five months later, once again letting people stew in that idea. Hell, that's especially not helped when you remember that a lot of Nazism, in particular neo-Nazis, loved to co-opt Norse mythology and symbolism to their cause. And I should nip this in the bud here now. If you make a comment saying Hydra are not Nazis, you're wrong and you will be blocked. They worked with the Nazis, they utilized Nazi tactics, they employed Nazis, their leader was the Red Skull, a frickin' Nazi. You might as well have just did a find replace in their pamphlets switching Nazi with Hydra. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck and Sieg Heil's like a frickin' Nazi, it's a frickin' Nazi. Don't try to split hairs when it comes to the frickin' Nazis. Just like all poodles are dogs, but not all dogs are poodles, all Hydra are Nazis, even if not all Nazis are Hydra. And both Marvel and Spencer were aware of this because even they were commenting on the book being relevant because of the resurgence of this kind of bullcrap in the last few years. And yet it feels like they don't actually understand what that means and what sort of a message they're putting out. This has been a long intro for a long event, and we're going to be getting into more details throughout as a result. Like with some other events we've talked about, this book had a lot of build-up to it, even making explicit reference to past events, some we've covered and some we haven't. So let's dig into Secret Empire and see where I think they went wrong, what things I think actually work, and more things that really don't work. Sucks. 
No looking at the covers in depth, generally they seem to be okay, though a few occasional confusing ones like issue number two's cover. What the hell is the scale here on this? And yeah, as I said, this book is long, so expect a lot of summarizing this time around with less examination of individual scenes. Still gonna snark, of course. I mean, what the hell show do you think you're watching? We're going to quickly summarize the events of the Zeroeth issue. Yeah, in addition to the regular miniseries being 10 issues, there's a Zeroeth. You add in some of the other material that was included in the trade, the free comic book day issue, the Omega issue, an issue of Captain America, and this could technically be seen as a 12, maybe 13 or 14 issue event. Cause you know, people were really clamoring for more of this after a year of unpopular buildup. We start with an unnecessary flashback to try to fill in some details of Hydra Cap's false backstory featuring Nazi villains in very silly hats. Including this dude, who looks like he started working on a Xenomorph cosplay, but gave up before he made the Jaws. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Okay, I'm... I, I was just gonna leave it at the joke and clip there, but then I decided, hey, I should find out who this guy is, because he might be someone important, and I'll get commenters mentioning it if I don't say who he is. <laughs> I couldn't find anything about it, so I had to go to, uh, to go to Twitter. <laughs> you wanna know who this guy is? Guess. No, sorry, time's up, because unless you knew it already, you'd never guess, it's Sir Isaac frickin' Newton! Yeah, apparently him and this stupid helmet were actually established in a previous miniseries or two to have this secret history involving alchemy and an order dedicated to protecting Earth that eventually became S.H.I.E.L.D. and him drinking an elixir that allowed him to live forever and he learned magic and actually became the Sorcerer Supreme for a while. I guess Newton's fourth law of motion is, it's magic, I don't have to explain it. And so, yeah, as part of this revised history that Kobik made, Newton is now the creator of Hydra and a full-on Nazi. Oh, and Nostradamus is there and a part of this too. Because why the hell not? You know what? Just go all out at this point. Who else can we add to the secret immortal founding members of Hydra? Abraham Lincoln! Mark Twain! The Kool-Aid Man! Although in reality, we know who really started Hydra. Mr. Computer. Anyway, once we get past this, we move into the actual meat of the Zeroeth issue, which opens to reveal that Hydra Cap, or Stevel as he's sometimes referred, which is both hilarious and accurate, has a big ol' Hydra symbol tattooed on his chest, which seems like a poor decision if he's trying to maintain his cover. A narrator, whose identity is not revealed until the very end, speaks about how he was the greatest of them, and that we just kept handing more and more authority to him, and we paid the price for trusting him, instead of trying to accomplish things ourselves. While I'm sure this is a reference to events that happened in the build-up to this, the actual authority we see him exercising is really just, hey, maybe we should have all our military actions during a complex situation from multiple attacks be coordinated from a single source for expediency, simplicity, Simplicity and efficiency. Unless he meant it's best if civilians all tried to respond to an alien invasion on an individual basis, which seems even stupider than tattooing the Hydra symbol on your chest. Anyway, that complex situation I just mentioned. Three different crises have happened at once. The first is that the Chitauri are launching a full-scale attack on Earth. A criticism of the book is that no one ever bothers to question why the Chitauri are attacking during this, but sometimes you've got to deal with the knife at your throat before you ask why it was put there. Their best bet to stop the invasion is a planetary defense shield, but a Hydra attack disabled its main station. Captain Marvel, aka Carol Danvers, is in orbit with a number of cosmic heroes like Quasar and the Guardians of the Galaxy confronting the Chitauri, while Iron Man and newer heroine Ironheart are busy trying to repair the shield. The second crisis is that an army of supervillains are attacking New York, payback for events that kinda got the whole Hydra Cap situation started that I won't get into here. Citizens of New York, I am Graviton, and you have been lied to! New York hot dogs are actually made of chicken! Chicken, I tell you! And then there's the last problem. Hydra has invaded the capital of Sokovia, and the government has formally surrendered to them. Also surrendering a bunch of previously believed destroyed Soviet nukes, threatening to use them if other countries don't recognize the new regime. A S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier that was in the area has gone quiet, so while they're scrambling other helicarriers to try to intercept the missiles if they get launched, it's the bulk of their fleet, and... 
Well, with the other two attacks, the whole thing is stretching resources thin. In orbit, Quasar, whose power arguably could rival Captain Marvel's, gets severely injured and taken out of the fight, while in New York, Nitro, that supervillain responsible for kicking off the events of Civil War, makes a big old boom in the heart of the city. As such, as part of then-recently passed legislation to deal with the crisis, the president is invoking the S.H.I.E.L.D. Act, granting Captain America, who's director of S.H.I.E.L.D. at this point, immediate command of the U.S. military and all federal federally recognized law enforcement. Cat makes a speech to all the heroes involved in the fighting. And then suddenly the planetary shield turns on, despite neither Iron Man nor Ironheart doing anything in the repairs that would warrant it. The villains in New York begin retreating as more heroes arrive to assist, and they finally get word that the helicarrier that had gone silent is A-OK. -okay. And it's heading on a collision course for the helicarrier Captain America and Agent Sharon Carter are on. Well, hey, two out of three ain't bad. It's a pity that all three are actually bad. Yeah, Hydra forces storm the helicarrier and meet little resistance thanks to the presence of a supervillain named Dr. Faustus, who is using his hypnotic powers to brainwash troops. Hydrocap orders the forces on the bridge, including Sharon, to stand down, revealing that he's in charge of Hydra. He has her taken away as he contacts Captain Marvel, who wants him to lower part of the energy shield so they can take care of the wounded, but of course he won't be doing that. He reveals that the Chitauri are attacking Earth because they have queen eggs on Earth and that he deliberately did this, trapping a lot of Earth's powerful cosmic heroes outside the shield and under constant attack by the Chitauri, who also can't get to Earth. In New York, Nazi supervillain Baron Zemo teams up with a villain named Blackout to swallow Manhattan in some kind of alternate dimension known as the Dark Force, sealing off another huge chunk of heroes, including Doctor Strange, inside of the city. Issues Zero ends with all the scrambled helicarriers instead arriving over Washington, D.C. So I will give the event this. This is a hell of a masterstroke for your evil plan. It's a great setup to cover various parts of the Marvel Universe in tie-ins, illustrates just how boned the heroes are when they're cut off from their biggest guns, and how this is truly an event for the Marvel Universe because of how much this affects things. My problem with it is that I think it happens too early. Following this was the free comic book day issue. This sure as hell should have just been part of the regular damn miniseries, because otherwise we go from the invasion beginning to just Hydra having already won. The long and short of it is that Steve pleads with the remaining heroes to surrender and accept this, that he doesn't want any bloodshed. They naturally refuse, and somehow everything goes to hell quickly. Thor, who was Jane Foster at the time, suddenly vanishes and drops Mjolnir. Vision and the Scarlet Witch suddenly are overcome, with Vision speaking in binary. Because, you know, complex artificial intelligences are programmed in binary. I hear data from Star Trek was programmed in basic. And all hope seems lost when Hydra Cap lifts Mjolnir, the narration stating that the enemy was stronger, more powerful, and they were... Worthy. Ugh. We'll get into this more later, but yeah, why this wasn't just part of the main story, I will not understand. So yeah, the actual proper first issue of the event begins, and Hydra has already won, now fully in control of America. Clearly some time has passed, I don't think it's stated how long, at least a month or two, as kids in school now happily proclaim, Hail Hydra, and all their textbooks have been thrown out in favor of revised ones. Inhumans are put into concentration camps, mutants have been forced into a section of California that they occupy and hold, and Hydra symbols are everywhere in public spaces. And that's what I mean when I say the invasion happened too soon. This event is called Secret Empire, but it's not a secret! Before the first frickin' issue starts, the Empire is out in the open and ruling it! Unless the actual Secret Empire is revealed to be the Mole Man with an army of gopher people rising up later, I think you might have blown your load early! Nitpicky, perhaps, but it is the name of the entire damn story, and it's invalidated quickly. Personally, I would have had a subtler takeover throughout the first half of the event, them secretly infiltrating the U.S. government with members of Congress and governors either under mind control or straight-up Hydra agents. Then, in issue four or five, they go out into the open. There is no secret to this empire. It's just an empire. We have a very, very odd scene to start things off. After a guy drops off his son at school, his son asks for a Captain America lunchbox. And the guy goes home and vomits one up. 
Ew. This guy is an inhuman, and he's quickly taken into custody. We'll meet back up with him right at the end of the story, you know, around the time everyone forgot he existed. Up in orbit, Captain Marvel is sending out an intergalactic distress call to the rest of the universe begging for help. They're wearing down under the constant attacks by the Chitauri, and she knows that eventually, once the attacks do end, either the Chitauri stop flinging themselves against the shield, or Hydra Cap releases the Queen Eggs, Hydra won't stop at Earth. The funny thing about Nazis and other nations and forces... Well, as you may have noticed, I've been using some letter Kenny clips lately, and this one seems apt. You know, if you, if you think about it, we actually share a lot of common ground. Historically, sharing ground hasn't been your strong suit. So, this is what I mean when I say the story is padded. Throughout Secret Empire, we will cut back to Captain Marvel, as well as those trapped inside of Manhattan, to see what's up with them. And for most of the story, their contribution to the plot is nothing. It's just to remind us they exist. Now, they do become involved in the plot again near the end, but for instance, we see a bit of life inside of Manhattan that's very similar to DC's No Man's Land, with gangs fighting each other over supplies to try to stay alive. We see the Kingpin being massively generous to civilians in the city, since he knows that eventually they'll be freed, and all the people he helped will remember his generosity and pay it back to him later. And that has nothing to do with this story. It's the stuff you would see in tie-in issues that expand the event. Because stuff like that is not actually relevant to the main plot. Hydra Cap and how the heroes are going to stop him. And like with House of M's padding, it's not that it's bad, it's quite entertaining. It's just it makes the event longer, and it feels longer. Especially when it doesn't end up meaning anything for the story. I'm just gonna skip most of that until we get to the relevant bits, if only because this episode is already gonna be super long, and there's enough to talk about already. In Los Angeles, a kid is rescued from some Hydra agents by several young heroes, including Viv Vision and Miles Morales. Meanwhile, Hydra Cap has his team of Avengers take down some kind of intelligent monster named Krigorath, killing it before it could harm any civilians or property. We'll talk about his Avengers later, but what follows that is a news report talking about all the good things Hydra has done. New jobs, crime rates down, low unemployment, trade deals, etc, etc. Like, the worst of it is that it's all related to the totalitarianism. Like, the jobs are for creating killer robots, or that 20 people are gonna be executed for treason. But for the rest of the country, fascism is doing A-OK! -okay. It's part of the larger problem with this event, which we'll talk about later. Oh, and they're also releasing mind control chemicals into the water supply to make people docile. This is during a meeting of the Hydra Supreme Council, of which, of course, steve is leading. They tell him about the kid who was taken by the heroes, as well as a lot of chatter and views on the internet of the incident before the state censors took down video. They feel that Hydra Cap is being too soft, and they need to make a firmer statement than just words. We hear about other things that Hydra Cap did, like offer full pardons to any civilians who rebelled the day they first took over, but he's just all, it was time to bring people back together. I don't want a prison state. Yeah, I mean, all they're doing is putting mind control drugs in the water. They're not authoritarians here or anything. At the hideout of the underground, the kids get chewed out by Hawkeye and Black Widow, who lead the underground. Since they were not authorized to rescue the kid, but they change their tune when he mentions that he has a message that could potentially change everything. From perpetual sidekick Rick Jones. We get another cutaway back to steve who's having dinner with Sharon Carter. Or rather, he's eating and she's refusing to do anything with him, because he's a fascist terrorist. This subplot feels like it doesn't go far enough. steve keeps thinking he can convince her to join up and that he still loves her and stuff, but all she ever seems to do except for one point is complain about the situation. I feel like the sheer amount of hurt, betrayal, and him standing against everything they believe in should make her try to grab that spoon on the table and stab him in the eyes with it. Instead, it's, I'm not going to have this nice steak dinner, Steve, because you joined the bad guys. Hmm. Oh yeah, and he mentions that in the reports he's reading, standardized test scores are up. Woo! He meets with Rick Jones in a cell, who also apparently had a cushy apartment, until he stole a bunch of files and gave them to that kid. steve once again tries to convince Rick that he's not some kind of monster, and doesn't want people to suffer, and he's totally still a good guy, as he prepares to have him executed. The kid is brought to the drunk, as Hawkeye called him, a.k.a. Tony Stark, a.k.a. Tony Stark's artificial intelligence copy of his brain projected as a hologram. <sighs> Comic books. 
Tony doesn't care to look at the data just yet, much to the kid's shock. In the intervening time, they had several theories about what had happened to Cap, like him being a clone, or under mind control, especially with Dr. Faustus around. But all their theories proved false, and chasing the leads ended up with tons of people dead, so Tony's pretty much given up hope on the idea of rescuing Cap. After Hydra Cap meets with Madame Hydra, who apparently has a bit of a motherly relationship with him, he elects to give in to the demands of the other members of the Council, and to show strength by executing Rick Jones, 19 other people, and the entire city of Las Vegas. But you know, he doesn't want this to be a police state or anything. 